Our text that we had this morning that Buck read in 1 John 5, 11 and 12. If you'll notice what it says, it talks about relationships. And this is the testimony that God gave us. Eternal life. And this life is in who? In His Son. He who has the Son has life. He who does not have the Son of God does not have life. That's a little bit unnerving. Or it can be. But you'll notice that it's all about relationship, that text is. And as life as we know it, happened in the Garden of Eden when Eve gave birth to her son. And we find in Psalms 90, verses 10 and 12, you're welcome to turn there if you'd like. Psalms 90, verses 10 and 12. It kind of gives us an indication of about how long we're going to be around this old world. Verse 10, the days of our lives are 70 years, and if by reason of strength they are 80, yet their boast is only labor and sorrow. So if we live to be old age here in this country, in this land that we live in, the Bible indicates that it's going to be full of hard labor and sorrow. And we suffer that here in this earth. We suffer. We work in the fields. We work hard. We lose loved ones. That's sorrow. But in verse 11, I'm sorry, not 11, 12, but it tells us to teach us to number our days that we may gain a heart of wisdom. And that's my prayer today, that as we come here and we worship the Lord God Almighty, that he would give us a heart of wisdom, of understanding. If I were to ask you a question, if you were saved, I would venture to say that most of you would say, well, I hope so, or I pray that I am. A few years ago, there was a song that came out. Maybe some of you might remember it. It was kind of a Calypso type of a song. The name of it was Don't Worry, Be Happy. How many of you remember that song? I see quite a few hands. Don't worry, be happy. And today, sometimes people use the phrase, no worries. You know, you'll be talking to somebody or they'll send you a note and they say, oh, no worries, don't worry about it. How does that relate to our salvation? Do we worry? Are we worried about it? I have a good friend who was a Bible teacher at an Adventist academy for several years. And he had a special class since he was the Bible teacher. It was a volunteer class that his seniors would take. And they received a couple of credits for it, but it was no big deal. At the beginning of each quarter, he would give them a quiz of five questions. And he asked them not to put their name on the paper. Why do you think he did that? He wanted them to tell the truth. The questions were, define a Christian. That's number one. Number two, so what do I have to do to get to heaven? Number three is if you had children, would you want them to have the same experience as you? And explain your answer. Number four, if you died in an accident on your way home, would you be resurrected with the saints? And explain your answer. Number five was, do you spend daily spend time in the word getting to know Jesus? 
Now, he kept these papers in a file. And a decade or so later, he decided to go through and compile all that information just to go back and see how it all boiled out after all these years. And he told me that he's, he went through these different papers and compiled all the data. He had tears in his eyes. These were 12th grade, three and four year, three and four generation Seventh day Adventist students who were getting ready to step out into a world a new world to them. The first question, define a Christian. Now he took all the different answers because not all the students gave him the same answers, that's for sure. But he compiled the trend of each one of those papers and this is the results of it. Define a Christian. Someone who's trying to do the best they can and stay out of trouble. Number two, what do I have to do to get to heaven? Do a good job at number one. Number three, If you had children, would you want them to have the same experience that you have? Absolutely not. Why or why not? Trying to be good and not being bad is killing me. I feel like I'm sitting on a keg of dynamite and it's about ready to explode. I don't want my children to live like this. And as soon as I'm able... I'm out of here. That is so sad. During this time, he was compiling other data for his report. So he called North American Division Conference. And he asked them for some information. And so they, they gave him this. For every attending Adventist on the books... There are five who don't attend. Now think about that. For every one of you sitting out here that are on, on the books of some church, there are five for each one of you who don't attend or have asked to have their names removed from the books. This was 20 years ago. I don't know what it would be today. Of those who attend church, 50% only attend once a month. Then they shared this, that if we would have kept 80% of our children since our church was organized in 1860, no baptisms, no profession of faith, just keeping our children, we would have had 8 million members. This was 20 years ago. The answer to question number four, if you died in an automobile accident, would you be lost? 90% said that they would be lost. Why? I'm not doing a very good job at what I know I should be doing better of. The focus was on behavior and performance. Any time that we focus on performance, we will never have assurance of our salvation. Never. Never. Even if we clean up on the outside and grit our teeth and come to church every Sabbath and prayer meeting every Wednesday night and, and we're here for Sabbath school and we study our lesson every week. You can't change your heart. And in God's word it says, 
Our heart is deceitful and evil. Who can know it? I don't say that. That's what God says. So when we pretend and not totally let him come and change our heart, we're only fooling ourselves. We're only fooling ourselves. Answer to number five about spending time with God. Their answer was, I didn't realize you could have that kind of a relationship. Didn't realize that they could be friends with God. There was no grace there at all. All works and behavior. That's what these children had grown up with. And that's how they felt. That's how they lived their life. And you might say, well, that's really terrible for our young people. You might, you know, we feel sorry for them, and yes, it's a bad thing, and, and we need to do something about our education system, and we can go on and on and make all kinds of excuses. How many of you remember Dan Matthews? I see a couple of hands. He used to be the speaker director for Faith for Today. He's retired now, has been for several years. And the last I heard from him, he was on the staff of a large church in Southern California in charge of visitation. He goes around and visits older people like me and like some of you. He goes around just to make sure they're all right and before he leaves he asks them if they have any special prayer requests. Most of them wanted prayer that they have assurance that they will come up in the first resurrection. Now these are senior Seventh-day Adventists, members, like you and I. If these people are seniors and are teenagers, have doubts about their salvation. What does that say for those of us in the middle? It says that a huge percentage of us are the same way. Statistics don't lie. That we don't have assurance. Or do you? I was going to sing you a song today, but I couldn't do it, so I'll tell you the name of it. And the name of the song is Make It Real. And the song asks for God to make himself real to us. And I hope that is your prayer, that you will ask God to make himself real in your life. Because when you do, and when you let him do what he wants to do, your life will be forever changed. So if I were to ask you, If you had some secret sin that you've not confessed, you may say, define sin for me, Pastor. And many of you would say, well, it would be 1 John 3, 4. Sin is the transgression of the law. Or my Bible says sin is lawlessness. And I'd like for you to remember these three texts and look them up, maybe in your spare time. Matthew 22, 37 through 40. Matthew 22, 37 through 40. Jesus says, law is love. And in Romans 13, 10, that's Romans 13, 10, Paul says, the law is love. And 1 John 4, 8 1 John 4, 8, John says, God is love. So, if A, Jesus says law is love, and B, Paul says God is love, if A equals B, which the Bible just said so, and if B, the law is love, equals C, God is love, then A equals C. The law of love and the law of God are equal to each other. 
So lawlessness is the same as godlessness. At its core, or at the heart of it all, sin is a broken relationship with God. And if you look at the Bible and focus on its central theme from Genesis to Revelation, the theme of it is God trying to restore a broken relationship with this world. That's bottom line. So much so that he gave his own son for every individual on the face of this earth. Not just for every Seventh-day Adventist church or every believer, but for every person. Now sometimes that's hard for us to grab hold of in our mind. Because we look at things going on in this world today and we say, how could God love somebody like that? How could God let that happen? How many times have you ever had people say, how come God let this person die in a car wreck? God didn't do that. We know who did that. But if God came down here and forced things to happen, what kind of a God would he be? Would he be a God of love? No, he'd be a God of dictator saying, here's what you better do, or if you don't, here's what you're going to get. That's not our God. That's not our God. John, 1 John 3, 4, Whosoever commits sin also commits lawlessness, and sin is lawlessness. Now my friend wanted to know, if he was on the right track when he was talking about these students and all the information he found. So he got a hold of the Greek professors at the university. And he asked them what all this meant. And their reply was, whosoever commits sin or lives apart from God transgresses also the law. For sin or living apart from God, results in the transgression of the law. And in Romans 6.23, death equals the consequences of sin. For the wages of sin is what? Death. But the gift of God is eternal life in Jesus Christ our Lord. Acts 17.28, God is the life source. For in Him we live and move and have our being. As also some of our poets have said, for we are also his offspring. Can you handle that? You're God's offspring. You're part of his family. You're adopted into his family. Jeremiah 2.19 Your own wickedness will correct you, and your backslidings will rebuke you. Know therefore and see that it is an evil and bitter thing that you have forsaken the Lord your God and the fear of me is not in you, says the Lord God of hosts. Now, that was a major prophet talking to the poor children of Israel. But he talks to us today. Those words of wisdom were not just for them. They're not put in this book just to show us history. They're there to teach us that we're no different than they were. We make some of the same mistakes they are. We're just a little more sophisticated. First John 3, 6. Whoever abides in him does not sin. What does that say? Whoever abides in Jesus... Does, does not sin. Whoever sins has neither seen him or known him. I'm glad we have a forgiving God, do you? And you remember what Jesus said when the rich young ruler came up to him and says, Good master, 
Jesus says, no, 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 there's only one good, and that's my Father in heaven. He didn't even consider himself to be sinless or to be good. So how can we be proud of ourselves? how good of a Seventh-day Adventist we are or a good Christian, whether you're Adventist or not? I want to read you a text. It's 1 John 5, 11, 12, and 13. And this is the testimony that God has given us eternal life. And this life is in his Son. He who has the Son has life. He who does not have the Son of God does not have life. These things I have written to you who believe in the name of the Son of God, that you may know that you have eternal life and that you may continue to believe in the name of the Son of God. So how do we get eternal life? We just finished a Sabbath school lesson. You remember the lesson on Genesis? It was a powerful, powerful quarter, wasn't it? It was for me, anyway. But it had a lot to say about Joseph. Joseph was a chosen child of God. Now, the Bible doesn't call that out a lot. But when you read it and you see how God took care of this young man, you know he had to have been a child of God from the very beginning. Because God selected his mother and selected his father, and Joseph was a result of it. And you remember what happened to him? He was spoiled rotten. His father treated him like he was the prince of the world. Gave him a brand new multicolored coat, and his, what did his brothers think of that? Yeah. They didn't want to hear about it. Not only that, God blessed Joseph being a dreamer. That he had visions at night. Or during the day, but whatever. And he told them to all his family. He thought that was a big deal. And all it was doing was just grinding their name deeper. Making them more angry at him. So much so that what happened to him? It threw him in a pit. They were contemplating how they were going to kill him. God took care of him. Sold him into slavery. Ended up in Egypt. Finally ended up in prison for something he didn't do, but God was always there. But what did Joseph do? Joseph trusted in the God of his father. When he went to work for Potiphar, he did the best job Potiphar had ever had done in his facility, in his house. Potiphar trusted his whole household to him. But when he, when he got accused of something he didn't do, they put him in prison, and what happened? He's running the prison. And the prison's making money now. And everybody's happy. God was blessing Joseph everywhere he went, in spite of the affliction that he was suffering. In the end, he gets promoted to the second in command of the world power. That's kind of hard to believe. This kid came from nowhere, a shepherd, and in those days, shepherds were the bottom of the pit because you read about it a little further when his brothers finally came and, Her and the Pharaoh was going to give him a job. He told him, tell him you're a shepherd. Tell him you're a shepherd. He was afraid they would get a job in a higher position and be drawn away from God. He was protecting his own family. But anyway, back to the point was that God had planned Joseph's life and blessed him all the way through, and Joseph was faithful to that. I've got to share a short story with you. Um, some of you may remember if you were at camp meeting several years ago. But anyway, this young fella grew up in a Christian home, um, went to school, uh, he went to PUC for a little while, but somehow or another, something happened in his life, and he got sidetracked, and he joined the military, and 
ended up with a medical discharge and things just kind of fell apart in his life. But in his heart, he remembered the God of heaven. Even though he wasn't doing the, living the life that he should have been, it was always there in his heart. Remember what the Bible says? Raise up a child in the way they should go, and when they're old, they'll return. Well, he takes off. He, he becomes a law enforcement officer. He marries, has a family, but nobody knows where he's at. He just kind of dropped off the face of the earth. But God knew where he was. And one day he stopped in Ohio to visit one, his wife's in-laws, his wife's mother, I'm sorry, his in-laws. And while he was there, the Holy Spirit spoke to his heart. And he started attending church again in a little town in Germantown, Ohio. They were full-time RVers, so he didn't stay there very long. But his travels finally brought him back to California. And then it brought him to camp meeting. And then it made him and got him in touch with the speaker that was supposed to be there at camp meeting during the evening service, the main speaker. They were walking around the campgrounds and they bumped into each other. They exchanged names. And it just so happened that this preacher's name was the same name as that little church he attended in Germantown, Ohio. And as they began to communicate back and forth to each other, he found out that the church was started by this gentleman's grandfather several years ago. Some of you may remember who he is, Henry Wright. The young man I'm talking about was my brother. You see, God brought him back to California, back to camp meeting. But he had already played out things to make it come together. Henry Wright was our main speaker in the evening services. Now, now, let me tell you something. Before that, six months before that, I had been asked to sing special music on Wednesday night at camp meeting. And lo and behold, that same Wednesday night, we baptized my brother at camp meeting. You see how God works in our lives? I had nothing to do with that. My brother had nothing to do with it. Henry didn't have anything to do with it. God orchestrated the whole round circle wherever he went and brought him to California on this perfect night that he was supposed to be there. Amen. Heard Henry's message and it just he, he couldn't wait to get in that tank. I asked our conference president if he'd baptize him. And he said, whoa, wait a minute. He hadn't studied. He had, I said, don't worry about that. Put that in the back burner. He's a Seventh-day Adventist. Has always been one. So Jerry Page baptized him, baptized him. And I don't think there was a dry eye in that auditorium. Because I read his, his, his testimony while he was in the tank. You see how God works? He not only took care of Joseph, he takes care of every one of us. If we could only see it, if we could only open our eyes and see and understand the God that controls this earth. He's not worried about Russia and the Ukrainian situation. He's not worrying about China. He's not worrying about our president and the price of gas and all. No, 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 no. You remember, he puts them in office and he takes them out. You think he's excited? You remember what he told Sennacherib when Sennacherib was going to tear down Jerusalem? He said, you tell him. You tell him. He ain't touching that city. He's going to be going home. And what happened? Sennacherib went home. An angel came in and killed 180 some thousand troops in the blink of an eye. And Sennacherib's own family killed him when he got back home. 
You tell me we don't have a God. He finishes what he starts. Most assuredly, I say to you, he who hears my word and believes or trusts in him who sent me has everlasting life. Shall not come into judgment, but has passed from death to life. That's John 5, 24. That's not Donald. That's God talking. You remember the apostles? All the struggles they had following Jesus. They were bickering among themselves, just like a church board meeting. They were calling fire down on the Sumerians because they didn't like the way they combed their hair or the way they looked. We're no different today. A little more sophisticated, maybe. But they stayed with God. They stayed with Jesus. Just imagine yourself being on an elevator. And there's an elevator operator. And you tell him where you want to go. And he pushes the button. Well, somewhere along the line, the elevator may shake or wobble a little bit. And you might fall down. But you're still going up. That's the way it is with Jesus. You're going to fall down. You're going to have difficulties in your life. But as long as you hang on to Jesus... You're not lost. You're still going up. You know, in this world today, there's very little thought of the child that was born that we might have and become, that we might have eternal life. And he has become our assurance. Let's look at 2 Peter 3, 9 real quick. 2 Peter 3, 9. Well, let's read 8 first. Finally... All of you be of one mind, having compassion for one another. Love as brothers. Be tender hearted, be courteous, not returning evil for evil or reviling for reviling, but on the contrary, blessing, knowing that you are called to this, that you may inherit a blessing. Jesus asks us to treat each other that way. To have compassion on one another. To love our brothers. Be tender hearted. Be courteous. But it's easy in this world if you look at what's going on. You see people fighting in Disneyland. Families fighting families. You see it in a mall down in Southern California people fighting over I don't know what but it's terrible terrible you know we read in the Bible about all the things that took place back in those times but we're seeing ten times worse that today but remember who's in charge remember 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 the message of Elijah Choose you this day who you're going to serve. If it be Baal, then worship him. But if it be God, then worship him. That's the message today. The Elijah message will be preached on this earth before Jesus comes. And if you read through the Bible, that's the message. That's the Elijah message. Repent and trust in the Lord. So it's not what you do that counts. It's who you know. And who you know determines what you do. And if you know Jesus, no worries. No worries.